What was that you said? Told me, brother uh, Don, about that preacher that held up his Bible. What was he said? He said, "If you're preaching out anything other than King James Version, you're preaching false. If you're preaching out any out of any other Bible but the King James Version, you're preaching false." So I hope you got your King James Version here tonight, uh, because that's all we use here. And uh, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter nine. Hebrews chapter nine. Uh, mention this. Uh, this morning in the preaching that we were planning on preaching out of this section and uh, did know exactly what we were preaching, but I, I, that's the topic that I was planning on preaching on. So uh, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, I'd like to read verses 6 and 7 and then 11 through 14. 6, 7, 11, and through 14. Now then these things were thus ordained, or when these things were thus ordained, the priest went into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God, but unto the second went the high priest alone. Once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of of the people. Now verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he offered, or he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself? without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to be here today. We thank you for the word that you've given us. And uh, just by the, re if we left here to, right now, just after just reading your word, we would be better off but we, than we were before. But we ask that you would help us and show us some things from your word at this time. Use me, direct me, turn my mind to the things that you would have me to say. Forgive me of my sins and enable me to be used by you. Lord, we would ask that if someone here hears this sermon, does not know Christ as their, their Savior, that they would come to know him, trust him, believe in him. Lord, we just ask that you would... Work on your people tonight. That we would be more that we should be. That, that we would be seek a greater service for you. That we would be humble. That we would be more committed. That we would turn from our sin. Whatever is accomplished here today, Lord, we give you all the, 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 the praise and the glory. For it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Preaching tonight on the blood, uh, trying to think of a, a, a better title, but that pretty much describes it, the blood. Just that we're talking about uh, the blood of Christ, uh, um, how it is superior. Hebrews is, somebody said once in, in my uh, schooling, that Hebrews is the book of greater things. Uh, Hebrews reveals the things that th they did in the Old Testament that were pictures of, of the one who was to come, Jesus. And this passage that we read uh, in chapter 9 and in chapter 10, it talks about the work there at the temple, the work of the high priest, and the work of the blood. Now we told you this morning uh, that the thought was, and the, the, the teaching from this is talking about the blood of these animals that were sacrificed there at the temple that uh, the high priest would go in on the day of atonement 
Now the other priests would go to the outer chamber and they would perform works and they would do things, but the high priest would come in and bring the sacrificial blood and pour it there as an offering out unto God. Now we said that blood never saved anyone. The only way that anyone was ever saved is in faith in the Lord. Those things were a picture of things that were to come. Let us look now at the insufficiency of their blood, the blood of goats and calves and, and, and bulls and, and uh, bullocks and the, and, and the red heifer and, and all those animals. That, that, that the, the, the scripture said that it was insufficient. Uh, verse 23 here in the same chapter said it was necessary that the patterns of these things in, in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. These things were given as a pattern, as a symbol. These, the, the, these things that they did, the rites and the rituals, and uh, as we specifically are talking about the blood sacrifices that were made, those were a pattern of things to come. Those were the, to, to, to show the people the necessity of the shedding of blood. It was to reveal to them the grave cost of their sins. Now we talked about Cain this morning and how God did not, did not accept his sacrifice. He offered up the first fruits of what he had. He offered up the best that he had. But Abel sacrificed a lamb. And he was accepted. The pattern that we see is we cannot please God by our works. Our works are done with filthy hands. We cannot impress God with the things that we do, with the things that we say. There are people who think, well, if I give so much to the church, or if I work so hard in the Lord's service, that I will be saved. But the pattern that we are given is the sacrifice because the work that we do does not demonstrate the horror of our sin, the wickedness of our sin, the ultimate cost of, of our sin. If I were to give, uh, uh, throw in a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, thousands of dollars, and throw it in the offering plate, that would not demonstrate to anyone how wretched and filthy my sin is. Well, you see that something has to die. And you look to the, the, the pattern that it has that someone had to die for our sins. We, we, we understand how, how wicked and how vile we are. We see the pattern. And in the pattern we see The beast. I'm not talking about the beast of the revelation. I'm talking about the animal that was slain. When that animal was slain, we have a picture of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. See, the sinner should be the one who dies for their sin. But instead, someone else was offered up for the atonement of their sins, for the payment of their sins. That beast is that picture. Once again, that blood did nothing but to show them the path, the trail of blood to the cross. We see the beast. In this pattern as well, we see the priest. 
The high priest would enter in once a year. He was prepared. He was ready. He would go in. This high priest himself, though, in the Old Testament was a sinner. When he was offering up the blood to, uh, as an atonement for their sins, as a picture of the atonement of Christ, he was also offering up blood for his own sins. The beast was insufficient. The priest was insufficient. They were just a pattern. They were just a picture for the one that would come. Matter of fact, any religious ritual that we perform is insufficient. We see the insufficiency of their blood but we also see the innocence in their blood. Verse 13 says, If the offering of bulls and goats and ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the puring of the flesh. In Numbers 19, we won't go there. We, we'll, we'll just talk about it. Numbers 19, verse 2. They are given... They are given the instructions on how they are to offer up the red heifer. How this was a specific sacrifice that God was telling them to offer up. And it was done in a specific way. And we see that the... These animals were innocent. Now these animals are innocent because they did not commit sin. An animal does not, is not guilty of sin. A lion, when it kills his prey, there is no sin there. He has no knowledge of good and evil. We read this morning out of Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 where Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, they were considered innocent. They might not necessarily have done everything they should have, but they were ignorant of it. They were innocent. A baby is considered innocent because they have no idea, uh, they have no sense of right or wrong. There are people that, that, that mentally never have the capability even in our court system, if, if, if someone who is, is for some reason mentally incompetent, they are not found guilty because they have no understanding of right and wrong. These animals were innocent. In 1 Peter. Chapter 1. verses 18 through 20. So he says, For as much as you know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without a blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. For you. The innocence of this animal also pictures the innocence of Christ. But the big difference between the innocence of the, of the creature and the innocence of Christ is Christ knew good and evil. Christ knew, speaking of pictures of Christ, this is not a biblical picture. It's not uh, anti-biblical by any means. I'm just saying it's not in the Bible. But uh, to me, uh, that movie that came out years ago, probably a dozen years ago now, if not more, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There is a character in that story. Now, C.S. Lewis was a Christian writer, and he was writing allegorically. And... Aslan the lion, the king, 
was a picture of our Lord. And as the accuser was accusing someone that Aslan was going to die for and to lay down upon the altar and sacrifice himself for, the accuser said to Aslan something about the law says. And Aslan interrupted him and says, Don't presume to tell me what the law says. I was there when the law was written. What a picture of Christ. As our accuser, Satan tries to accuse us of things, as he willingly laid down his life, he knew what the law required. He was innocent, but he was fully aware of good and evil, unlike these creatures. In Hebrews, uh, well, since we're already in chapter 9, let's go ahead and... Uh, And, and actually, I've written the wrong verse down, so never mind. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. I had a couple of scriptures. Oh, I'm looking, I'm in 1 Corinthians for some reason. Try this again. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, verse 28 says, For Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, Hebrews chapter 4, 15 says this about Christ. For we not have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but by all points tempted as we are yet without sin. See, the, the, these animals innocently went to their deaths because they could not be convicted of any sin. Christ went to his death completely innocent because unlike us, when he was tempted... He did not sin. Just as 1 Peter talked about that, that uh, a lamb that was without blemish and without spot. And all these sacrificed animals were to be without blemish and without spot. Christ was without blemish and without spot because he did no sin. He had every opportunity to sin, but he didn't. Every temptation that we've ever tasted, faced, uh, 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 felt. He was also subjected to. Yet he was without sin. The only reason these animals were qualified for the sacrifice is because their perfection and their innocence. We see their innocence. We also see their ignorance. These animals were bred, born, and raised for the purpose of sacrifice. It became a business there in Israel to raise these animals for the purpose of sacrificing them. Christ was born bred and raised. His entire intention of coming here to this world was to be offered up as our sacrifice. Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He was foreordained. We read that verse out of Acts chapter 2, verse 23, that said it was by the predeterminate counsel of God that he was offered up into the hands of wicked men. These animals ignorantly went to their death, as we said this morning. Isaiah said that he went as a lamb to the slaughter. He spoke not a word, but he was fully caught. When, when uh, um, he was put on trial, he spoke not a word in his own defense. 
Why would he defend himself? Because it was for that very cause that he came. He wasn't trying to get out of it. He wasn't trying to escape it. As they led him down the Via Dolorosa, he could have called legions of angels to protect him, to defend him. We read in Revelation where the armies of the Antichrist face him down and they are destroyed by the sword of his mouth. In other words, all he had to do was speak the word and those that mocked him and tortured him and pushed him along the way, threw rocks at him, I'm sure, they would have died, but he willingly went not out of ignorance, but out of love for us. Amen. He was foreordained and he was foreshadowed. In the scriptures, we see that. Hebrews 10.1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never of these sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. He was foreshadowed. God knew, Jesus knew at the foundation, before the foundation of the world, that all these things was going to happen. He was foreshadowed in the scriptures, not only in the sacrifice, but all throughout the Old Testament, we have pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he was going to be, where he was going to be, how he was going to come, and how he was going to die, and how he was going to raise again. The word there is shadow is used. A shadow doesn't do anything, does it? If you see my shadow, you can't feel it. You can't hear it. If I walk by you, my shadow touches you. you unless you see the shadow, you have no idea it's there. It has no power. But if you see my shadow, it's a picture of me. You know I'm there. Have you ever seen some, a, a shadow around the corner and you've known someone's there? Every once in a while you'll be playing, maybe uh, playing with the kids hide and seek or something and they think they're really clever and they're hidden and you see their shadow there. The shadow doesn't do anything but reveal what is there. He was foreshadowed in the sacrifice. He was foreshadowed in the scriptures. The Old Testament preached of Jesus. The reason why Abraham was saved is because he believed in Jesus. The reason why David was saved is he called him Lord and believed in him. Any of those men and women that died in the Old Testament that did not die in their sins, it was believing in Christ and believing in the one that would come and redeem them from their sins. Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth. He was speaking of Christ. He was foreshadowed in the, the sacrifices. He was foreshadowed in the scriptures. He was foreshadowed in his schooling throughout the three and a half years that he was in his public ministry. He told his disciples specifically and others heard that teaching and knew that he was going to offer himself up. While they didn't fully understand, it seemed like the, Jew, the Jews that were against him had a better understanding than the disciples did. Because they were always questioning it. They were always arguing it against it. But when he died, the Jewish leader said, he said he's going to come back on the third day. It, it kind of, you kind of wonder why the disciples couldn't grasp that. But the non-believers seemed to know. He taught of his death, his burial, his resurrection. He taught of his sacrifice. 
when he first came upon publicly upon the scene. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now anyone who was a Jew should have known what that meant. He was foreshadowed. He was foreordained. And he was faithful. He staggered not at the will of God. He went completely faithfully and offered himself up for our sins. And we see in the scripture here the inadequacy of the blood of the bulls and the goats and the calves. Verses 11 and 12 tell us that yearly the high priest had to go in. Yearly the high priest had to go in and to offer up sacrifice. Now it was a different high priest. Every year you, you, you served one term as high priest. But yearly, a high priest would go in and offer up. But it says here in verse 11, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Christ came and died once for my sins. Why is that important to say? Because there are a group of individuals who weekly crucify Christ. They symbolize him as still being upon the cross. And they preach and they teach. They constantly have to go to him. And he constantly has to be re-sacrificed for their sins. Now the old way, the high priest had to do that. But our text said that when he died for our sins, it was re eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 10. Verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there was a, re a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats should take away, or that the blood of bulls and goats should take away our sins. His sacrifice was a holy sacrifice. It was not just a ritual sacrifice. Matter of fact, I think it's a shame when churches get together to worship God and it's just a ritual. There's no true worship there. It's time to come to church so people come to church. It's time to sing a song, so we sing a song. It's, it, it's time uh, to uh, uh, pray. It's time to, to hear a sermon. It's time to do this, and we just go along and do it. Our service should be holy. His sacrifice for us was holy. It was a holy sacrifice. Chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered up to bear the sins of many. Notice that word many. It means he didn't die for everyone. It means that he didn't die for every single individual that ever lived. He died for who? He died for his elect. He bore the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We see the holy sacrifice and we see the high priest. Verse 12 in chapter 10. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. 
You know what would have happened if the high priest during the temple worship would have sat down? If he would have stopped his work at all while he was in the Holy of Holies, he would have died. The scripture said he would have died. If he stopped for a second, if he meandered, if he loitered at all, he would have died. He had work to do there. But after that work was complete and he came out, he sat down. When Christ once offered up his sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why did he sit down? Because the work was done. The work was done. It was finished. There is nothing that he needed to add and there is nothing that you need to add to your salvation. Salvation is offered to us free. It is the gift of God. When you believe in rites and rituals and all these other things, you're not believing in Christ. Christ made the atonement. The blood that was shed during those sacrifices were just a type of the blood which was to come and to be sacrificed for our sins. Won't you stand? We sang that song earlier. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.